up, Steve. Great, you thanks. Good afternoon, it's good to see everybody. Greetings again from Iowa. You know, when the Soybean Association asked me if I could do a presentation at ISU, I thought I was headed to Ames. That's what Iowa stands for, I oughta went to Ames. My message is to wrap up today's session, but it ties the crop marketing to risk management. And here's what I'd like to accomplish in the closing remarks. I want to look at what USDA said on February 21st. I don't totally disagree with Darren Newsom is that it's a stretch to think that we're going to trend line yields for 2013. But more importantly, there's a decision that happens in 11 days from today, it's crop insurance. We know our projected prices. For corn, it's 565 a bushel. For soybeans, it's $12.87 per bushel. I contend that if you can tie crop insurance revenue protection to a pre-harvest marketing plan, the odds favor the higher new crop prices sit in the spring and summer months. Darren called them the seasonals. And I'll show you how we can tie these together. I'm not quite as bullish as Darren. There's not a lot of people that are quite as bullish as Darren. We were going to cross Darren and Sue Martin, and I think we'd call it a bull, no doubt about that. Uh, but I want to tie this issue of crop insurance and pre-harvest marketing. With that, on the screen is what USDA Ag Outlook, and again, I'm not saying USDA was wrong. They're putting together budget numbers. They did the same thing last year. They're basically forecasting 96 and a half million acres of corn, but look at the trend line yield. 163.6 bushel an acre. We've only done that one year, and that was a nine, and that was a wet crop, and they probably overestimated the size of the crop. More importantly is the demand. I agree with Darren in the fact that the likelihood is we're not going to increase our livestock demand or our ethanol demand fast enough for that size of crop. To me, the most important numbers are these. Ending stocks triple by August of 14. I have trouble imagining a perfect growing season. I'm from the Western Corn Belt where the good news is we're going to get a half an inch of rain tonight and tomorrow. The bad news is it's snow and 20 mile an hour winds. We're extremely dry throughout most of the state, but more importantly what USDA said was average price, 480. The whole marketing year, it would have to play out a perfect scenario and a perfect weather to get us there. So I'm not trying to pick on USDA, I'm just saying the likelihood is, is ending starts aren't heading over 2 billion bushel, I believe. Uh, we're probably going to head above a billion, my gosh, we're already at 635. And those areas that are shaded would take us above a billion bushel ending stocks. Again, the seasonals favor new crop corn and new crop bean prices rallying in the spring and summer months. Don't get excited about new crop corn prices falling out of bed. Uh, I heard that last week at the Commodity Classic. Well, I should have already have sold my 2013 corn. Hopefully you caught some of last summer's rally, but I think it's way too early to be worrying about growing the largest U.S. corn crop in history with the driest subsoil moisture in the Corn Belt since 1955. We got problems in the Western Belt. You said, well, you've been getting snow. Yeah, a half inch of moisture at a time. We need 16 to 18 inches of moisture between now and August. And I'm not so sure that I'd bet on that. The soybean number was not as bullish, the right-hand column comparing the 12 crop to the 13-14 marketing year. Ending stocks double to 250. But look what USDA said about price, 1050 a bushel. No range. 
1050 a bushel beans. I'm sure the livestock industry liked to hear that. And the soybean crush industry liked to hear that. But we've not even planted a bushel of beans. I think ending stocks are probably going above the 125. But again, in this scenario, using USDA's demand, only those areas in yellow would send ending stocks above 200 million bushel. Be careful about putting a lot of stock in the Ag Outlook Conference. The intent is to create a budget baseline for USDA. And the likelihood is USDA overestimates the yield by using what they call trend line, in this case, 44 and a half bushel an acre. Step back and grab reality. Dr. Gary Schnitke's numbers, what's it cost to grow soybeans in the state of Illinois? If you know your costs minus land and estimate your revenue, yield times price, in this case, Gary's using $6 a bushel corn at 188 bushel, central Illinois data, you calculate what we call the non-land margin. And I think Gary's very skilled, the best in the land grant system at some of these estimates. Most of the estimates are coming from the Illinois Farm Business Association. What this tells me is I agree corn is a more profitable rotational crop most years. If you want to compare the bean side of the equation and you know your cost non-land and you estimate your revenue, that's 56 bushel an acre times 12 and a half per bushel cash price, it does give you a good framework of corn versus soybean rotation. And it also gives you the framework that those that are bidding 400 and 500 and 600 dollars an acre cash rent probably is going to pull more of those acres to corn. But let's step back from price and let's step back from costs and let's talk about crop insurance. There is a big difference between Iowa and Illinois. We both grow corn and beans. In Iowa, we send our governors to the Washington to be secretaries of ag and I think Marion told me where you send yours. <laughs> I was doing the top producer conference about six weeks ago and somebody made an announcement in Chicago. They said, did you hear the governor got out of prison? And I said, which one? <laughs> Iowa does not use as much grip or revenue protection with the harvest price exclusion. Iowa farmers are more risk averse. We use revenue protection. If you want to compare Iowa and Illinois, I don't have a problem. 92% of all of our acres last year were RP. In the state of Illinois, only 81% of those acres were revenue protection. Same way with soybeans. I'm not saying you're wrong. I know the grip is big in Illinois and Indiana. Remember, I was here for the panel discussion when they were complaining about the county yields because you're betting on your county yields. It's nothing to do with your yields. I'm not against grip, but you've got to buy it up at a high level of coverage and a high level of price. So you're probably putting 80 to $100 an acre into a grip policy for corn. In Iowa, we simplify it. We use revenue protection. We're betting on our yields on our farms, our 10-year histories. It kind of looks like this. In the next 11 days, you've got to make a decision, and I'll use the 80-20 rule. Over 80% of all your insured acres in Illinois are using RP, revenue protection, but you've still got to make a decision about the level of coverage. 65, 70, 75, 80, 85% level of coverage. You say, which one's best? It depends. But when you move to a, a higher level of coverage, you reduce what we call the deductible. So if you pick 65% level of coverage, 35% deductible, you pay a lower premium and the government subsidizes a larger percent. As you move to 85%, you pay a higher premium, smaller deductible, and the government subsidizes a smaller percent of that. But don't stop at the product, RP, and level of coverage. 
What unit structure are you using? Basic, optional, or enterprise? Not a lot of people use basic coverage anymore because basic is by section, by ownership of land. But many of you use optional units, and I don't have a problem with optional units, especially if you have variable land. But as long as you meet the test of 20 acres or 20% of the unit in a different section, many of you probably move to enterprise units, and I'll tie enterprise units back in making a premium decision. But don't stop at the RP level of coverage and what type of unit structure. Trend adjusted APH yield endorsement. That's your own Dr. Bruce Sherrick at U of I that gave you that in 12. What a gift. Don't ignore the importance of trend adjusted yield. Most everybody in this room should take the trend adjusted yield. If you're using RP or RPHPE or YP. But we're also seeing an add on of what we call hail or wind. And this is true even if you're using grip policies. Now, hail and wind aren't subsidized by the federal government, but it's important that you consider adding that coverage, especially if you're in enterprise units. Let's tie all these pieces together. I'd like to start with TA. Why did Steve Johnson from Iowa State University say, take the TA, push the TA? It's easy. Let's create a county. Let's pretend it's McLean County, and it's corn, and those APH yields are in that second column. It's the last 10 years you insured that crop on that farm. It, simple average of those 10 years is what we call the actual APH, but look in the fourth column. That is called the trend adjusted yield, or let's just call it the TA option. Make this simple. I predict most everybody would want to take the TA option. And you say, why? Well, it's because you get to go back into the last 10 years you grew the crop on that farm. And you get to adjust it by how many years back. In my example, let's say you grew corn on that farm and 10 years back was 1999. You have a county factor, in this case the county factor is 2.4, I actually don't know your county factor, but it's close, every county's different. But you don't have to know your county factor, your crop insurance agent already knows this. You simply schedule an appointment with your crop insurance agent. But here's the simple question, which would you rather have in 13? A corn yield of 175.5 or a corn yield of 194.2, take your time. Most everybody's going to take the higher. I agree. Now, somebody in this room is going to say, well, Steve, that one's going to cost a higher premium, and I don't disagree. But this is the cheapest way to increase your APH and your revenue guarantee. Let's take this a, a little bit further. I want to save you some money. I don't have anything to sell. I don't have an online service. I don't have a marketing advisory. I don't even do crop insurance consulting. I contend that I can save most everybody in this room two to four dollars an acre in corn and one to two in beans by just listening. I contend that if you choose to use enterprise units versus optional units using that same actual APH of 175.5 at the 80% level of coverage, your premiums for enterprise units are about a third of optional units. Now, I had a magazine at my meeting last week, and they said, so everybody ought to take enterprise units. No, especially if you have variable ground or you do not meet the minimum of 20 acres or 20% of the unit. But I believe most of you in this room using revenue protection probably will be using enterprise units. Now some will say, well, where did this enterprise unit come from? Five years ago, the National Corn Growers Association negotiated with the Risk Management Agency. And in essence, what they did is in that right-hand column. As you move to higher levels of coverage, 
the government subsidizes a smaller percent of the premium. But look in the right-hand column. In the right-hand column is enterprise units. It's fields in the county. So if you elect enterprise units, you can't separate your fields by section lines as you could in optional units. You have one field. It might be 12 different corn fields, but for crop insurance losses, there's only one field. That's why there's a large subsidy, much larger for enterprise units than optional units, because you're taking more risk. So the government's passing that on to you. So let's go the next step. Let's look at the actual APH of 175.5 compared to taking the TA option. I contend that if you take the TA, you could actually move to a lower level of coverage, in this case optional units, from 85% actual APH to 80% TA and basically pay within a dollar an acre of the same premium. So if you're in optional units, take the TA first. Then look at the premium at different levels of coverage. Now, I contend that the majority of those of you in this room are in enterprise units. Let's make the same comparison. In the right-hand column is the TA option, and in the left-hand column is the actual APH. If you compare actual to the TA, and this time enterprise units, and you want to move from 85% to an 80% level, making the same comparison, you just reduced your premium by $2 an acre. What's my point? You have 11 days. At March 15th, a week from Friday at 5 p.m., the bell goes off and you're done. You can still add wind. You can still add hail. But you can't make changes to your federal crop policy. So a review. Number one, what premium strategies would I recommend for revenue protection in 2013? Take the TA. Don't even blink. Don't even blink. It's an all in, all out. You can't take the TA on the home place and not on the rented farms. It's a county by county decision. Most everybody should want to take the TA because the TA, trend adjusted APH yield endorsement, increases the amount of revenue guarantee. Number two, compare the savings that you get from enterprise units, county lines, to optional units, section lines. There's more risk when you move to the county lines for calculating loss by crop as compared to staying in the section lines, optional units, but take the TA. Because when you take the TA, a new door opens. It creates the larger revenue guarantee. And then don't forget, there's another interacting factor. Pick the appropriate coverage level after you take the TA and after you compare optional to enterprise units. I think many of you are out of order. You take revenue protection and then determine the level of coverage. Save yourself some money, folks. Take revenue protection, push the TA, compare enterprise to optional units, then determine the most appropriate level of coverage. In both of my comparisons, two and three, I picked up an extra $32 an acre revenue guarantee by pushing the TA and went down a level of coverage. And then consider adding hail or even wind, hail for both corn and beans and wind for corn, especially if you're in enterprise units, if you're going to be committing bushels to delivery, forward contracting or HTA, or if you are in grip coverage. Because in grip coverage, you can't separate your farms you are betting against the county yields. Let's take a look at the weather forecast. I know Darren had put up the drought monitor from UNL. 
Probably the best thing ever to come out of Lincoln was that drought monitor. This is the forecast for the next eight weeks. Source, National Weather Service, NOAA. Look at the dividing line of the Mississippi River. It stays abnormally dry in the western belt. And you are the dividing line. You are the dividing line. This is the forecast from the National Weather Service. And we do know that we are in neutral ENSO, and ENSO stands for El Nino Southern Oscillation. Basically, it's too early to forecast northern hemisphere weather. Sure, we've had some moisture into the Corn Belt over the last couple weeks, but it's not significant in the big picture, especially in the western belt. It's rare to have back-to-back -back droughts in the Corn Belt. In fact, if you look back at 100 years of data, it's very rare in the central Corn Belt. But what I want you to know is that we are at neutral ENSO, not La Nina, not El Nino. And we've got this guy at Iowa State named Elwin Taylor. I bet you heard of him. And he follows what the likelihood would be if we go back to La Nina, where we've spent the last two summers, we would have 70% risk of below trend line yields. If we stay at ENSO neutral through the summer months, it's almost a coin flip as far as what would be trend line above or below. And if we could move to El Nino, which is our good growing conditions, which we've not seen in the summer months since nine, we would have above average trend line yields. Dr. Taylor is now forecasting below trend line yields for Iowa. He's not making a forecast for Illinois. And you say, why? Is it because of La Nina? No, it's because of the lack of moisture in the subsoil. We lack moisture deeper than three feet. We've got some winter moisture. And the farther northwest you move in Iowa, the worse the conditions. The closer you move to South Dakota, the worse the conditions. The closer you move to Kansas, the worse the conditions. And that's what Darren was talking about. It's hard to imagine a perfect growing season. So you say, well, how's all this fit together in a marketing strategy? Because I don't want to sell anything that I haven't produced. Well, with revenue protection, you can. With RP, that's over 80% of your insured acres in Illinois, you simply separate your delivery bushels, the bushels that I'm willing to forward contract or HTA, from the bushels that I don't want to deliver. And then you begin to understand that RP, we've had the product for 17 years, creates insurance bushels that can be committed to delivery. In essence, Insurance bushels are your actual production history on your farms times the level of coverage times the higher of the projected price, February average, versus harvest price, October average. In essence, crop insurance revenue protection works like a subsidized put option. And the government subsidizes your premium, roughly 70 to 80 percent of the premiums paid by the federal government. When we begin to see insurance bushels can be delivered in forward contract in HTA versus those bushels that I don't want to deliver, I think you put together a marketing plan. And the plan is consistent year in and year out. It kind of looks like this. I'll use corn as an example. Let's say the last 10 years on your farm that you grew corn, the APH actual production history is 180. You multiply 180 times the level of coverage, and I'll be simple, I'll just use 80%. I'm not recommending 80, but most everybody in this room's probably going to go 75 to 85% in 13. If you multiply 180 times 80%, you get 144 bushel an acre. And if you multiply it times the projected price, it's obvious I didn't know what it was, 
I was using 568, it turned out to be 565. Those in the green jar are my bushels, my insurance bushels, guaranteed. If I don't come up with a, if in this case, $818 an acre, I collect a check. I don't want to touch the deductibles. Those bushels I might buy a put option. I could hedge those bushels. In essence, my strategy is revenue protection can be worked with a marketing strategy of delivery of those bushels up to your APH times your level of coverage. There's risk, there's basis risk, but it's very small. The basis risk is what if the harvest price was actually lower than the cash price? That means a positive basis, and it's very rare to see a positive basis, especially in Illinois, the month of October. And if you're farming the bottom ground, careful. It's because if you take prevented planting, you can only collect 60% of the revenue guarantee. Let's take a look at what these prices are. Again, these were discovered during the month of February. This is the final number. If you want to write them down, you can. Todd will be giving these on the radio tomorrow. They're 565 a bushel for corn. You're guaranteed 565 a bushel times your APH times your level of coverage. That's how the revenue guarantee is calculated. For soybeans, the number is 1287. It's the simple average of the 19 trading days open outcry in the month of February. That's why we don't know the projected price until about March 1st, and your agent doesn't know the premiums until today, March 4th. Because it's the projected price plus the last five days of February that give us our volatility factors. The good news is our volatility factors are lower this year than they were last year, which means you're probably going to have lower premiums for the same product and the same level of coverage. If you would, compare your levels of coverage, 65%, I'm going to use 180 bushel an acre. Notice at the lower levels of coverage, a higher percent subsidy. As you move to higher levels of coverage, and you can now make these calculations, as you move to higher levels of coverage, a smaller percent subsidy. That's why the premium calculations I gave you had three interacting factors. Actual APH to TA was an interacting factor. Optional versus enterprise units was an interacting factor. And the level of coverage was an interacting factor. If you can use all three of those, you begin to look at what the actual premium will be. Premiums aren't due till October 1st. But the decision that you make in the next 11 days determine what those premiums are. Now, I thought it'd be kind of fun to come up with an example. This is the best example I can come up with. Let's pretend you've got 180 bushel an acre APH. And let's pretend you sell 100 bushel an acre. That is the bar in green on each of these lines. Now, here's what I contend. If you commit 100 bushel an acre, that's about 70% of your guaranteed 144 bushel an acre. Let's say you average $6 a bushel. I heard Darren say that it's probably reasonable that we could get $6 a bushel average price. And when I ask farmers, about three-fourths of the hands go up. Yeah, I could see that we might get $6 a bushel cash price. So those are my insurance bushels committed to delivery. Now, let's play a game. The game is this, what if that's all I produce is 100 bushel? Then in the left hand column, you collect an indemnity payment. The indemnity payment is around $368 per acre. How'd you calculate it? Well, I was guaranteed the higher of the projected or harvest price and projected came in reality of about 565. So I get a multiply of 565 times my 100 bushel an acre. That's called my revenue to count. But I was guaranteed $818. Here's my point. If you only grow 100 bushel an acre, 
and you sell all 100 bushel an acre, you're going to collect an indemnity check with low harvest prices of $4.50. Now here comes the counter to that. Steve, what if the harvest price does what it did last year? It goes to $7.50. You're going to collect an indemnity check. You're going to collect a check. It's not going to be quite as large because the revenue to count is going to be that $7.50 times the 100 bushel you actually produced. But you get to subtract it from a new revenue guarantee. The $7.50 harvest price is higher than the $5.65 actual. He said, well, I've got to have more proof. I really don't trust you because you are from Iowa. Okay? What if I grew 200 bushel? That's your answer. That's what you're praying for. I'm going to grow 200 bushel corn and I sold 100 and the harvest price is $4.50. You're not going to collect an indemnity payment. You don't want to collect an indemnity payment. But the corn's worth 50 cents under, a 50 under basis for those extra 100 bushel. You say, well, you know what I really want, Steve? I want a 750 harvest price and I only sold 100. Then I only feel bad about selling those first 100 bushel. But what's the chances that the harvest price, the October average, is 750 and you grew 200 bushel corn? I don't think the odds favor. You said, Steve, what's your point? If you sell 100 bushel an acre and you were guaranteed 144, if the harvest price goes down or the harvest price goes up and you only produce 100, you collect an indemnity payment. You probably got 25, 30 bucks in that thing. The government's probably got 60, 70 dollars in that. And you're only paying the smaller percent. If the harvest price goes down and you have 200 bushel corn, or the harvest price goes up, you don't collect crop insurance, but you have more bushels to price. Let's take another run at this. Let's go back 12 years and let me show you the projected price, the February average every year since 2001, the year that we got the Federal Crop Insurance Act that crop insurance still operates under. Here's the February average every year for the last 12 years, including 12. And here's the harvest price every year. What if you were to see the highest December corn futures price from the 1st of March till the end of September? There they are. The highs are coming in the spring and summer months. Almost every year. And I know where your eyes are at. They're on 8, June 27th. They're on 11, August 29th. And they're on 12, the highest December corn futures price in history, 849, August 10th. The highs were there. Sell your insurance bushels, at least a part of your insurance bushels in the spring and summer month. When we look at seasonals, and I think Darren did a good job of this, here's the seasonals. Here's December corn futures every day on average for the last 10 years. I'll break them into two categories, 03 to 07, from January to the end of September. There's the seasonals. The highs tend to be in that March, April, May, June time frame. But look at this next build. This is what's happened over the last five years. The highs are coming at higher levels, the right-hand side of the chart. And they're coming later because we're running tight ending stocks and the weather problems have been developing in July and August. I contend that new crop corn and new crop soybean futures are still in the spring and summer months. I'm not saying I can predict whether they're going to be higher than last September's 1409 and a half for soybeans or last August high of 665. Darren made reference to those as being the high water marks. But I'm not getting nervous about pricing new crop corn if I don't have new crop corn sold yet because of the seasonals. Let's run the same chart on beans. Your APH is 60 bushel. You sell 30 bushel. You average 12 and a half dollars a bushel cash. You're using the spring and summer months. Same game. What if the 
harvest price is $11 and you only grew 30 bushel an acre, you're going to create an indemnity payment. You're guaranteed real life $12.87 a bushel for any shortfall. So $12.87 a bushel on those 30 bushel are going to be your revenue to count. You're going to have to subtract it from your original revenue guarantee of $5.18. If the harvest price goes to $14, you get an indemnity check, but notice it's not quite as large as that first one. Don't forget, it's your revenue guarantee minus your revenue to count. It's your actual yield times the harvest price. And if we have more bushels and low harvest price, or more bushels and high harvest price, we get the money from the marketplace, not from crop insurance indemnity payments. With that, when I look at 12 years of soybean data, it's not that much different than corn. Here's the February average projected, and here's the October average harvest, and there's the highest prices between March 1st and September 30th every year, and there's those highs from 8, July 3rd, 11, August 30th, and 12, the highest tick for new crop beans $17.89 September 4th. They're all sitting in this window from March 1st to September 30th that you can continue selling using your insurance bushels. Again, I think the frustration comes from the seasonals are moving on me, Steve. Uh, look at the seasonals. They don't really start rallying much in beans until we get out to April and May and June. But the seasonals over the last five years haven't been rallying until we get out into June, July, and August. The highs off the right-hand side of the chart are sitting in the spring and summer months, but over the last five years, they're coming later. They're not at harvest. Harvest was 1539 October average. You missed the 1789. I believe the seasonals are still in play. The tight ending stocks and the adverse growing conditions in each of the last two summers are giving us higher prices. They're just coming slightly later than we're used to. And we spend August beating ourselves up for the bushels we've already sold, where we ought to keep selling. What are my pre-harvest marketing thoughts? Number one. Revenue protection, RP, is preferred if you're going to be making crop insurance bushel sales, the delivery of those bushels. And then every March 1st, we get a new barometer, all right? We get a new barometer. We've got it. It's 565. Let's sell new crop corn when December is above 565. Today, we're at 550. Let it ride. I wouldn't be in a hurry to sell new crop corn right now. Hopefully you got something sold last summer, but if you didn't, I wouldn't be in a big hurry, and I wouldn't be in a hurry now to sell under the projected price. That's your guarantee. Let's use the 565 corn, and let's use the 1287 beans as our barometer, and when we're above those prices, let's be more aggressive in our pre-harvest sales. And those can be delivery bushels, bushels that are sold via forward contract or HTA. That rarely happens. And again, use futures and options, but not necessarily on the bushels that are covered by crop insurance. Let's use forward contracts and HTAs. Let's use futures and options in the bushels we don't want to deliver. And then what would be some strategies? I expect new crop futures to remain relatively high this spring and summer. We've got tight global ending stocks. We'll get a report on Friday, March 8th, that will probably show that continued tight ending stocks. And we've hardly planted any new crop corn, perhaps in South Texas, but it's wet there. And so the likelihood is this market still has to play out. I would use my crop insurance guarantee and I would try to sell above the projected price, the February average, 
565 on corn and 1287 on beans. And then if you're going to use put options, don't go buy puts now. In my opinion, wait. The seasonals take us to higher prices. And if I can wait till May or June, there'll be less time value. Those options will likely be purchased at higher strike prices and less time value. And look at the new short dated options being featured at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. The likelihood is, is we don't have to go all the way out to a November or an October termination of those options contracts. Let's look at short dated options. And then sell bushels, but sell bushels to meet your fall and winter cash flow needs. With about 80% odds, the highest corn price comes in the spring and summer months. With about 70% odds, the highest bean price comes in the spring and summer months. Let's be patient. We still have to plant a crop and we have to have near ideal growing conditions to ever come close to USDA's 163.6 trend line yield in corn and 44.5 trend line yield in beans. I would encourage you to use the spring and summer months for those sales. I'm not against storing, but I don't like storing commercially for long periods of time for beans two months. Use the January HTA for beans because even if you pay too much storage for those beans, that basis narrows quick enough. Between the middle of October and the middle of December, you're going to get all your money back. And then you can determine at the local elevator co-op whether you want the money in 13 or you want the money in 14. And then lastly, that attractive basis for September deliveries, I believe that we're going to see positive Illinois basis for early sales that are made probably in June and July for first half SEP delivery, just like last year. You know, when we talk about early planning in Iowa, we're talking April and May. I'm in Illinois, we're talking late March, baby. Not even blinking. But remember, if you plant before your early planting date for crop insurance, you still have crop insurance coverage, but you violate replant. You can't collect under replant. You still have to use good farming practices. Five strategies that I'd recommend. Number one, always prove your APH annually. Even if you're in grip or group, you always prove your APH, your actual proven yield every year on every farm. In case you ever go back to optional units or the government ever cuts those subsidies for enterprise units. And don't forget acre used crop insurance information. And then we're going to have lower premiums. In Illinois, corn premiums are going to go down 4% for 13. Soybeans down 9%. And the volatility factors are lower. The primary difference is going to be that soybean projected prices are going to be 1287, not last year's 1255. You're going to buy more for less with crop insurance in 13 than you did in 12. But I believe there's higher revenue risk. I believe there's higher revenue risk coming at you. And then I'd choose revenue protection or to a lesser extent, maybe grip HR if you've had success with grip HR. But make sure whether it's RP or grip HR, Consider adding hail to corn and beans. Coming back to the section line, adding wind, green snap coverage to corn, or using Enterprise Plus, a new tool that I think many of you are aware of. And then take the TA. Don't even blink. Don't spend a lot of time figuring out TA. Iowa led the nation last year with TA, 78% on corn and 74% on soybeans. Somebody said, why would Iowa lead the nation to TA? And I said, Iowa State University. I don't know if they bought that or not. I don't think so. But understand enterprise versus optional. That unit coverage is still an important decision. If you don't notify your crop insurance agent, you've got the same product, the same level of coverage. Remember, TA is an option. It's a box you check. But it's an annual decision. And then lastly, I'm a big proponent of pre-harvest marketing. For 17 years, we've had CRC or RA, and now we call it RP, or GRIP HR. You don't have to wait to pre-harvest marketing. In most cases, the highs are behind us. 
I don't think I'd be in a big hurry to forward price 14 crop. I'd use the uncertainty of the 13 growing season to throw out my early sales for 14. And probably a harvest delivery for 14. But I don't want to do it in March. I want to do it when weather in the northern hemisphere becomes the focus. What would be some websites that I'd want to promote for crop insurance? The big one is the one that you know about, and it's FarmDoc. And I'm a friend of Dr. Gary Schnitke and Dr. Nick Paulson that was here on the program earlier. And I use this, and I'm using FarmDoc daily, just like Todd does, and many of you do. I think they do a great job. But there's other websites as well. So with that, I'd field a couple questions if you have them. I know we're running ahead of schedule, and I know I separate you from the drawing. <laughs> but a couple questions that you might have of me. Make it an easy one, Todd. You know the traditional adage, uh, short crop, long tail? Mm -hmm. Many people feel that you know, this was the year, but others said that with the low you know, carryout, essentially, mm -hmm. Compared to the past years, that was a difference. What's your thoughts? You know, I, I do believe in that old adage, but it's an old wise tale. But we've been following that. Uh, again, short crop, the 12 crop, we're going to simply have a tail like a brontosaurus. We're heading for lower prices eventually. I agree with Darren Newsom. I don't think we're going back to 1789 beans. I don't think we're going back to 849 corn. I believe that we'll rally this market in this probably April, May, June time frame. I think I'd want to be in a position to grab those prices. But let's make sure they're above our projected price and maybe some early 14 sales. I'm like Mike Bulgy. One of these days, we're heading back. And then we're going to talk about the good old days. And the good old days were 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. Uh, it will have to be... Uh, a a drought to get us back to those August and September highs, I would not be putting a large percent of my risk bushels out there by doing nothing. Sell enough to pay your cash flow, but let's use revenue protection and sell insurance bushels. Other questions? Go ahead. With one more year before we go to a new farm bill, can you explain again acre and direct payment and what you feel the growers should be doing? Sure. I wish Gary was here, but I can handle this. The direct payment is the same program you've been signing up, the DCP. Sign up already began, began the 19th. Uh, most everyone should go sign up for the DCP program. You will not get your direct payments until October. It could be subject to sequestration, somewhere in that 5.3 to 10%. So you might not get your $24 an acre direct payment. What's different this year is acre. Acre is average crop revenue election. And you can either stay an acre in 13 or you can get into acre in 13. But because acre is triggered first at the state level, it will be difficult to trigger an acre payment in Illinois and Iowa in 13. And you say why? Because acres trigger guarantee can only go up by 10%. So Acre didn't get this full-blown 720 corn. It had a cap on it. And I know the numbers in Iowa, but I don't know the numbers in Illinois. The number in Iowa is $781 an acre revenue trigger. In Iowa, if we have low yields, we tend to have higher prices, just like Illinois. I believe it will be extremely difficult to trigger an acre payment in Iowa and Illinois, corn and beans in 13. It's possible. It's a low investment. It's 20% of your direct payment and 30% of your loan rate. So that idea of maybe waiting until May, and if it looks like we're going to plant a large crop and this price is going down, maybe an acre. But in all likelihood, we're not going to see a lot of people run to the acre program. It's triggered at the state and it's triggered at the farm, but I would not put 20% odds that Iowa or Illinois will trigger an acre payment in corn and beans in 13. The trigger, uh, the revenue triggers are just too low to think that we're going to create an actual yield times a national price 13, 14 that's going to be that low. Gary did the numbers on it, um, and I think you have to make the decision on that one June 3rd. June 3rd, acre. Um, for acre, that is. 
Uh, and if you've been in, you still have to make the decision. And as Steve said, if you want to get in, you have to make that decision. But you have until June 3rd. Uh, he's been asked this question quite a bit. $4.60 December corn futures are lower than you want to get in. Yeah, and that would be, you know, if you're looking at in that May, June time frame, roughly speaking, and he usually, usually uses a high, uh, high yielding Central Illinois farms uh, and $4.60. And I'm not against acre, but there's a reason that less than 20% of all of our acres in the U.S. are an acre. It was difficult to understand and it's difficult to trigger. It's the state level revenue that's difficult to trigger because when Iowa has a low yield, we tend to have higher prices. Same way with Illinois. Same way with Illinois. He, he made me laugh when he said Iowa, Iowa State was the reason that RP was uh, the sign up for uh, the biggest crop insurance sign up in Iowa. Uh, Illinois happens to be the largest acre sign up from the very beginning and that was probably the U University of, I think it was, uh, yeah, I think it was yeah. University of Nebraska that probably came over and did all that training. <laughs> yes, you beat us by 1% in 2009, I will admit that. So I want to thank you for your time. Thank you for inviting me to your Profitability Summit. Have a great growing year. God bless. Thank you very much.